Hello, and welcome to Catholicism in the Car. My name is Parker Zerbo. Alrighty. Um, I want to continue our discussion about how we can truly revive the liturgy in the Catholic Church, and and thus revive uh, the Catholic Church, Catholic culture. We discussed last time how I kind of see two main calls for revival within the Second Vatican Council as regards the liturgy. And those would have been an increase in the active participation of the laity and a a use of the vernacular language. I want to get to the vernacular language uh, today, but I want to I want to first say a few more things regarding um, active participation of the laity, because uh, last time we discussed how true active participation involves the the layperson in the pews understanding what's going on spiritually and mystically at Mass, and that they are able to offer all of themselves up in union with Jesus Christ crucified unto the resurrection of the life. So on a, on a, on a spiritual level, that is the active participation that is required. But I think also on a, on a, like a more physical level of the laity participating in the liturgy, I, I would say that that involves the uh, the responses that have been um, that have been added in the the new order of the mass, the Novus Ordo, and and I think for the most part, um, I don't see much of an issue with those responses. I think that when a Novus Ordo mass is said incredibly reverently, when it's said ad orientum, when there's Gregorian chant or polyphony and or polyphony. Um, in the liturgy, when uh, people are fully focused as much as is you know, possible for a community to be uh, on uh, the primacy of the sacrificial aspect of the mass and the, the fact that the the mass is a is a union of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary that it, it represents that sacrifice on Calvary and and the people are aware that they should be spiritually uniting themselves to that sacrifice, then I, then I don't see much of an issue with the uh, physical responses that are given by the laity in uh, congruent uh, after what the priest says. And I think in a lot of ways this is, um, this is contiguous with what happens in the Eastern Rites, uh, where there is uh, quite a beautiful active participation of the laity in, in the, the singing of the various chants. Um, and uh, those responses that do happen in many of the Eastern liturgies. So, like I, I would say that, that is a legitimate aspect of the revival of the liturgy. Um, not to say that how the Tridentine Mass developed over time, so that uh, really the laity were in a state of contemplation. Not to say that that is that is bad. Um, where because in the Tridentine Mass, the, the the traditional Latin Mass, the laity are are basically silent the entire Mass. There's there's a couple points where they will respond, um, but they are they are basically silent the entire Mass, um, and are are kneeling for almost the entire Mass except for uh, the readings. So, and, and I think there's a lot of value there. I think there's a lot of value there in the way that that developed. But at the same time, it does lend itself to um, to the layperson being confused to thinking that uh, they do not need that, that it. it, it can lend itself to a diminishment of the communal aspect of the liturgy, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. And like we talked about last time, 
personal prayer flows from the communal prayer, not the other way around. Uh, when communal prayer is done right, it is an incredible catalyst and aid for the personal prayer of those that attend. So I would say that uh, the Tridentine Mass, I, I can see where the Church, where the Council Fathers of Vatican II saw a need for um, for revival there. All right, so I think that pretty much sums it up for active participation in the laity. Uh, yeah, yeah. So now let's move on to what the Church uh, talked about by means of including or, or beginning to use the vernacular in the liturgy. Now, I think it's important to keep in mind the entire historical perspective of the church. Um, Latin was basically a vulgar language, a common language in the church, um, a, a vernacular language in the church, until, you know, I don't know, I, I'd say about somewhere between the 800s and the 1100s. Um, in that time, there's the, the various Romance languages are kind of developing, you know, and Latin is starting to fall out of favor. Um, they, or I guess you could say Latin is organically developing into these various Romance languages, Italian, Spanish, Romanian, uh, French. Um, yeah, so that seems to be kind of what happened. So for, for roughly Roughly, first millennium, uh, Latin was a vulgar language in, in many parts of the church, of the Western church, right? Uh, clearly, it was not the vulgar language in the Eastern church. That was Greek. Um, but uh, but it, was, it, it was the vulgar language in the Western church. And, and I think that there was, and still is, very good reason to keep a majority of the liturgy in that common language of the church for the sake of the emphasis of the communal aspect of the liturgy. If it is said, for the most part, in, um, in the common language of the church, then that brings a very beautiful aspect of community to the liturgy where, you know, t today, yes, Catholics can go anywhere around the world and they have a gist of what's going on. But if the majority of the liturgy was in Latin, um, or if all of it was in Latin, I, I wouldn't be opposed to that, um, then, then the communal aspect of the church is really emphasized by that. Um, no matter, literally then, no matter where you go in the world, uh, you will get the same experience. Um, Although, although I do think that there was some m merit to what the Council Fathers were saying about incorporating a bit of the vernacular into the liturgy. Now, I think they were pretty clear. Vernacular was not to be, um, was not to be meant in the music uh, because Gregorian chant and polyphony were meant to stay the main um, and primary forms of music within the liturgy, right? And those have been pretty much uh, standardized in Latin. Um, where I could see a an increase of the vernacular would be in the readings, uh, the readings at Mass. And in whichever... Uh, whatever parts change significantly day to day, which which aren't actually very many. Um, so I would think like basically the opening and closing prayers and maybe certain prefaces. Um, but then again, those prefaces can be so short sometimes that uh, it may not even be necessary to have them in the vernacular. 
people don't often listen to them anyway, even when they are in the vernacular. So maybe that's not necessary. I mean, I could I could argue that it would just be the opening and closing prayers, and the readings would be in vernacular. I, I think, or even just the readings, <laughs> I would be all for that, um, because of the emphasis of that communal aspect that um, having a common language brings. Um, I've heard people argue, you know, Latin is a sacred language and all these sorts of things. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily see how, how any language could really be considered a sacred language, except for potentially those languages in which Holy Scripture was written. And as far as we know, uh, you know, no, none of the scriptures were written in Latin originally. All the manuscripts that we have are either in Greek or in Hebrew. So, I don't know. I've never heard a very good explanation of that. I should probably ask some some friends that I know that might make that argument, why they would make it. Um, but I don't find that very convincing, saying that it's a sacred language and therefore it needs to be used. I think really the main, the main thrust of the argument is that we are one church. We are one church. The Western Rite, um, the Western church is one church, and we should have a common language. Um, for the sake of a common culture. Uh, so, yeah, I think that pretty much sums it up on the vernacular. We'll see if I can think of any more things um, on some reasons for for making um, make giving the vernacular use in the in the liturgy. I would argue. I think I would argue mainly in the readings that should be the use. Um, and maybe in a few other places, but the majority of the mass, I think, should still be in Latin. Um, and and I would argue that that, that is what Sacrosanctum Concilium argues, is that point, um, that the vernacular is to be allowed, um, but but I think the document's pretty clear that it, that it wasn't, they weren't intending it to, for the entire Mass to be said in the vernacular. Um, I would also argue that saying the entire Novus Ordo Mass in Latin is a very beautiful and wonderful thing. And if you have um, people that really know their Latin and, and they would even enjoy the readings being said in Latin, like maybe in relig various religious communities or seminaries, things like that, I think that would only be good um, in those situations for the sake of the common uh, the common prayer of the church. So, all right, thanks. Oh, uh, real quick, real quick, please feel free to uh, subscribe to any of my podcasts on any of the podcast players. Find me on YouTube, please subscribe. Like me on Facebook, like the Catholicism Card channel on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, we're all there, Catholicism Card. Find me. And then I also have a Patreon account if you wish to support what I do at, at this podcast and this YouTube channel. And you can also support us on anchor.fm. There's a support button there you click on. I also have links to all of this on my website's support page at www.catholicisminthecar.com.